apparently climbing now in the Canadian Rockies and is not listening to this talk. Uh, I'm at a hotel and uh, using the internet connection there and hopefully that'll last for my whole talk. So uh, practical numbers. My story begins with Fibonacci in the year 1202. In his famous book, Liber Abaci, the, the same book where he introduced the uh, Hindu Arabic numerals to the West, uh, he uh, was interested in unit fractions, sometimes called Egyptian fractions, one over N. And he noticed that some numbers like 12, every fraction uh, uh, up 1 12th, 2 twelfths up to 11 twelfths, or even 12 twelfths, um, can be written as a sum of distinct unit fractions where the denominators are divisors of 12. So it, it's distinct unit fractions, denominators, divisors of 12. For example, 5 twelfths, you can see is 1 sixth plus 1 fourth. It's also one third plus I can't get the sound. What? Did someone say something? Anyway, um, if you take these equations and you multiply them through by 12, you can see that the numbers from one to 12 uh, can be written as a sum of distinct divisors of 12. And that's the definition of a practical number. Or you could take Fibonacci's definition if you'd like, but he didn't call them practical. They were called that by Srinivasan in a short article that he wrote in 1948. Um, and he had a dig at the metric system, I guess, which he didn't like. He said that um, the subdivisions of money, weight and measures, were often done with such numbers as 4, 12, 16, 20, 28. Uh, they're usually thought to be so inconvenient as to deserve replacement with powers of 10. But he liked these numbers, such as 12 and so on, because of this property of, um, I, I suppose, I'm not sure why it's so practical to have every number from one up to n being represented as a sum of distinct divisors, but that's what he called them. And maybe it was the Fibonacci uh, thought as well. Anyway, he began a study of the multiplicative nature of practical numbers. And uh, but he didn't uh, come up with a criterion. And this was done uh, independently in 1954 by Bonnie Stewart and uh, Václav uh, Sierpinski in 1955. And um, essentially, this is what their definition is, uh, their criterion is. It's a recursive definition of a set of numbers. And the recursive definition says that the set contains the number one. And also, if it contains a number m, then it contains all of the numbers m times p for all primes p up to sigma m plus one. Uh, sigma of m is the sum of divisors, of all of the divisors of m. So, um, and this recursive definition uh, gives a set of numbers and that's the set of practical numbers. Uh, here's uh, Fibonacci, Srinivasan, and Sierpinski. So from the criterion, we can see that every power of two is practical um, because um, I guess because one is practical and the criterion says you can go up to sigma one plus one, which is two for the next prime. And uh, once you have a prime, you can put in any power of it you want. So uh, the powers of two are practical. Uh, the, the fact that you can represent numbers uh, smaller than powers of two by divisors of powers of two is just the binary representation of a number. Also, the criterion shows that every practical number after one is an even number. Um, so let's see if we can prove this elementary criterion of uh, Stewart and Sierpinski. Um, so uh, first, you, we should note that the criterion is obviously necessary. If um, the prime P is bigger than 
sigma m plus one, then you cannot write p minus one, which is bigger than sigma of m, with uh, um, divisors of mp. You can't use a p itself because that's too big. And uh, all of the divisors of m together add up only to sigma of m, and that's smaller than p minus one. So the, there's a necessary condition that p is less than or equal to sigma of m plus one. And then to prove it, we're going to look at actually at a stronger uh, statement and prove a stronger statement that, um, that not only can numbers up to m be represented as sums of divisors, but every, um, every number up to sigma m p to the alpha. So, um, so we're going to assume we're going to prove, in fact, that for a practical number m, you can get every number up to sigma of m. And then we're going to prove that by induction. So let's start out by um, uh, assuming that um, every number up to sigma of m is a subset sum of divisors of m uh, by way of induction. And let's let p be a prime not dividing m with p of the right size less than or equal to sigma m plus 1. And we're going to prove it for all of the numbers p, m p to the alpha, again by induction on alpha. So this is a double induction. OK, so if alpha equals 0, our induction hypothesis is that everything is cool at m, so m is good. Um, now we'll assume it holds at some alpha. And we'll look at this interval i sub a. Um, here a is just an integer less than or equal to sigma of m. The left-hand endpoint of the interval is a times p to the alpha plus 1. And the right-hand end of the interval is that number plus sigma m p to the alpha. Now you'll notice that a times p to the alpha plus 1, a being less than or equal to sigma of m by our induction hypothesis means that a is a sum of distinct divisors of m. And here p to the alpha plus 1 is a divisor of m p to the alpha plus 1. So this is a divisor. This can be written, represented as a sum of divisors of m p to the alpha plus 1. Plus, if we throw in divisors of m p to the alpha by induction hypothesis, we can get every number up to this point. We can hit every number in this interval with divisors of m p to the alpha plus 1. But does that get every number up to sigma of m p to the alpha plus 1? Well, first of all, note that if, since we're getting all the numbers up to m p to the alpha plus 1, uh, at, uh, it means that we, this interval wraps around to the next interval at a plus 1. Um, and so let's look at sigma of m p to the alpha. Um, it's greater than or equal to um, p to the alpha plus 1 minus 1 because of our assumption that sigma of m is greater than or equal to p minus 1 and this formula for sigma p to the alpha. Uh, and so these intervals i sub a can be glued together and they keep on going until you reach the end uh, at this point and this point is equal to sigma of m p to the alpha plus 1. Uh, maybe a little garbled here but this is uh, how this criterion is proved. So one can wonder if it's a practical number theorem giving an asymptotic for n of x. So that's the notation I'll use for the number of practical numbers up to x. So Srinivasan began this also. He, he computed that n of 200 is, is 50. And he wondered if maybe this fraction 50 over 200, whether that is going to be going to zero when you count up to higher levels or not. In 1950, Erdős uh, claimed that, in fact, it does, that n of x is little o of x. Erdős didn't supply a proof, but I believe this is what he was, he was thinking, using some ideas that he used frequently. So he was quite familiar with the theorem of Hardy and Ramanujan that a number n is uh, usually close to log log n prime factors. And this is true whether you count distinct prime factors uh, or not. You can count with or without multiplicity. 
Uh, so let's look at a little bit higher than log log n, 1.1 times log log n. So the hardy ramanujan theorem says that asymptotically all integers have fewer than 1.1 log log n prime factors. And there's only density zero of them with more than 1.1 log log n prime factors. So let's assume now our n is in the majority set with at most 1.1 log log n prime factors. That means that the number of divisors of n is at most the power set on these primes. I'm assuming these primes occur with repetitions. Nevertheless, I can just take the power set on a set of this size, two to that power, and I get uh, the number of divisors, an upper bound for the number of divisors. And um, so now let's look at the power set of the, of the set of divisors. Look at all possible subset sums of divisors. So that's two to the two to the 1.1 log log n. That's sure, certainly a, a big number, this of the double exponential, but log log n is pretty small. So how does this compare with n? Well, if you bring the two up to the top as log two, you have a 1.1 log two. 1.1 log two is less than one. And if you bring log n down to the middle here, so you have two to the log n to an exponent smaller than one. So that's even smaller than n to the epsilon. So there are just not enough divisors to have enough subset sums to be equal to all of the numbers up to n. And so n, if it has at most 1.1 log log n prime factors, it's not gonna be practical. So that's a proof of the Erdős claim. Now, um, this just says little o of x. However, um, uh, here are our heroes, Ramanujan, Hardy, and Erdős. If, if you look at a more quantitative version of the hardy Ramanujan theorem, uh, you actually get x divided by a power of log x as an upper bound for the number of, of practical numbers. The exponent here, eta, is this expression, which is actually sort of famous in the anatomy of integers, uh, about 0.086. So, an upper bound is x divided by log x to the 0.086. But point, that's not the right exponent to have here. And Gerald Tenenbaum in a couple of papers in 1986 and 1995 show that it's basically one. The exponent here should be one. It's x over log x. He had a, a, a positive power of log log x, upper bound, and a negative power of log log x in the lower bound. But the main shape of this is x over log x. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, Eric uh, Seya got rid of the log log factors. This notation here looks like a smile and a, and a frown, uh, is some notation in analytic number theory that means that n of x is less than a constant times x over log x. And it's also greater than another positive constant times x over log x. So it's order of magnitude of n of, n of x is x over log x. That is the correct order of magnitude. Now this is all going towards uh, a conjecture that Maurice Morgenstern had made a few years earlier in 1991. And he did some computing. He computed up to 10 to the 13th and found that the number of practical numbers up to that level was looking like a constant times x over log x where the constant is about 1.341. And so he made this conjecture that there should be some constant and n of x should be asymptotically a constant times x over log x. So this was proved in 2015 by Andreas Weingartner. And uh, he didn't compute the constant in his 2015 paper, but just earlier this year, he published a proof that the constant is actually very close to what Morgenstern uh, thought it might be. He said 1.341, uh, uh, Andreas shows 1.33607. Here is a, a sort of a closed form for the constant. It's not closed because it involves an infinite sum um, or, and the sum is over practical numbers. And at first glance, you might even think that this sum is a divergent series because if the, uh, here you have a one over n, n ranging over practical numbers. The, the practical numbers are distributed sort of like primes, constant times x over log x. 
the sum of the reciprocals of the primes is infinite. However, this one over n is multiplied, well, see, what is it multiplied by? It's multiplied by this thing. Well, what is this sum? Well, by essentially the prime number theorem or Mertens, this uh, sum over the primes up to sigma of n plus one is the log of sigma of n. So here's the log of sigma of n minus log n. Well, that's the log of sigma n over n. So that actually, actually can be pretty big, making this divergence look even more troubling. However, here we cut it down a bit. Now we have a one over log sigma of n, and that's enough cutting it down to get it to converge slowly. It was somewhat of a triumph for Andreas to get so many decimal places for this series to converge, um, uh, to, to, to compute that series sum because it converges so slowly. So you had to use some extra cleverness. So Lola Thompson in 2012 in her dissertation gave a, a generalization of practical numbers. Um, so we don't consider numbers, we consider polynomials. So here we look at the polynomial uh, t to the n minus one. I'm calling the variable t rather than x because I'm using x as a uh, bound to count up to. So you have t to the n minus one, and we can look at its divisors over the integers. For example, it has the divisor t minus one. And we'll notice that t to the 12 minus one has divisors of every degree up to 12. Now, how can we see that? Well, let's look at the irreducible factors of t to the 12 minus one. These are the cyclotomic polynomials, uh, phi sub d of t, where d ranges over the divisors of 12. So one, two, three, four, six, and 12. Those six cyclotomic polynomials have degrees one, one, two, 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 and four. And the question is, can you use these weights to make up every number up to 12? Well, it's obviously, obviously you can, that's easy. And so this number, this polynomial has divisors of all degrees up to 12. So if you call um, such a number n to be phi practical, this is the Euler phi function. The reason she called it this is because uh, phi of d is the degree of the dth cyclotomic polynomial. So the criterion, the arithmetic criterion, is that um, for every integer m up to n, there's a subset of the divisors of n, such that um, if you add the phi of d for d ranging over that subset, you will get m. So you can ask if there's an analog of the Sierpinski-Stewart criterion for the phi practical numbers. And it turns out that it's, that it's quite tricky, uh, which, which means that it's not just a, a, a simple uh, analog. So for example, with practical numbers, if you have one and you peel off the top prime, it's still practical. But it's not true for the phi practicals. So for the number 315, three squared times five times seven, that is a phi practical number. But if you peel off the seven and are left with 45, that is not phi practical. Um, in fact, around 22, 23, those uh, degrees cannot be represented as uh, divisors of, t to the 45 minus one. Another example is nine. Nine is not a phi practical number, three is. So this is an example where if you increase a prime uh, from a phi practical, it doesn't stay as phi practical. Um, so um, that's not true for the practical numbers. So nevertheless, uh, Thompson was able to use uh, the say uh, machinery to, sh to show an analog of his theorem that the number of phi practical numbers up to x is of order of magnitude x over log x. And she conjectured 
that there is also an asymptotic. And she did some computing, and it seemed like here the constant was near to one. So she even wondered if, in fact, it, it should be asymptotic to the number of primes up to x. So a few years later, with uh, uh, Weingartner and myself, we, uh, the three of us proved uh, Thompson's conjecture. And uh, we didn't actually compute C, but we gave the heuristic that it is close to one, but not one, it's slightly smaller. So another application of the ideas behind practi practical numbers is uh, numbers with dense divisors. The, these were defined by Tenenbaum and written about by um, Saya and uh, Weingartner. Uh, a number with dense divisors, here is the sequence of all divisors of n. Start with one, go to the next one, and so on, up to n. And look at the ratios of consecutive divisors, d sub i divided by d sub i minus one. If all these ratios are less than or equal to two, then uh, that's the definition of a number having dense divisors. Uh, these are, in fact, were used in the studies of practical numbers, and, and it's not very hard to see that any number which has dense divisors will be practical. Now, this uh, condition on dense divisors is similar to the Erdős propinquity problem. So Erdős uh, wondered about the density of integers, which just have, has two consecutive divisors, d, d prime, with the ratio between one and two. Is that true? Well, it's obviously true for a positive proportion of numbers. For example, it's true for all multiples of six because every multiple of six has divisors two and three. And the ratio of three over two is bigger than one and less than or equal to two. So there is a positive proportion of numbers that have such a pair of divisors and Erdős uh, conjectured that in fact it's density one. This was finally proved uh, in a joint paper of Meyer and Tenenbaum in 1984. But then again, dense divisors is not that there should exist one pair, but that every pair of consecutive divisors should have that relationship. Um, so um, there's a multiplicative criterion for the integers with dense divisors. And this criterion is useful in the study of practical numbers because it's very similar to the criterion of Sierpinski and Stewart. So for Sierpinski and Stewart, if M is practical, you, you can take every prime P up to sigma M plus one and throw it in. With the numbers with dense divisors, you can take every prime P up to two M and throw it in. Um, in the study of practical numbers, one can generalize this where you replace two with a larger number, and that also plays a role. We now know after their work that there's a distribution for numbers with dense divisors. It's again of the shape constant times x over log x. So because of this expression x over log x, it seems natural that, you know, x over log x is so much associated with prime numbers. So it seems natural to ask similar questions for practical numbers as one asks for prime numbers. So for example, the famous conjecture is, are there infinitely many twin primes? So let's ask for twin practicals. All the practical numbers after one are even numbers. So we can't expect n and n plus one both to be practical infinitely often, but we can expect perhaps n and n plus two to be practical simultaneously infinitely often. Morgenstern um, proved that this is in fact the case, that there are infinitely many. And then in a new paper that I have with Feingartner, we uh, got estimates for how many there are up to x. The 
the conjecture is that the upper bound is, is tight except for the constant. By the way, this notation, less than, less than, in analytic number theory is the same as big O, where this says that n sub two of x is less than or equal to a constant times x over log squared x. And it means it's greater than or equal to a constant times this lower bound. So um, you can ask uh, how uh, we prove these theorems. Um, so for example, on the um, upper bound, I, I can't see my, my screen here. Are we looking at, uh, oh yeah, good. So we're looking at the upper bound. Uh, so we write a pair of, um, of twin practicals. We pull off um, initial divisors of n and n plus two. By an initial divisor, I mean all the primes in M are less than or equal to all of the primes in Q. And the same thing for M prime and Q prime. And I'll choose M and M prime to be in this interval since these numbers are practical. They have divisors in this interval, X to the one seventh, X to the one third. And then we, we fix a pair M, M prime uh, of practical numbers uh, in this interval. And we then count primes, uh, sorry, numbers Q. Q has all large primes, because they're all larger than the primes in M. Such, so Q satisfies a few properties. It satisfies the property that QM plus two is a multiple of M prime. And it satisfies the property that if I divide that QM plus two by M prime, I'll get a number that purports to be a Q prime, and that only has large prime factors. So this argument would get x over log squared x times the power of log log x. And we have some technical hurdles to overcome the power of log log x and get the x over log x squared. So how do we show, how do we get the lower bound to show that there are x divided by that power of log x number of twin practicals up to x. So we, we uh, do it as follows, uh, pretty much. We choose two practical numbers in this interval between square root of two, uh, sorry, one half square root of x and square root of x. And we choose a pair of practical numbers in that interval that are almost co-prime. Their GCD uh, is two. And um, which is as, essentially is as low as a GCD can be between two uh, practical numbers larger than one. And uh, so given such a pair, there are going to be A1 and A2 such that uh, A1 M1 minus A2 M2 is two. And um, a1 is, uh, is small, uh, A1 is, is smaller than M2, and A2 is smaller than M1. And so we have um, multiples of practical numbers. And uh, the, the multiple is small enough to guarantee that the product is again practical. So these are twin practicals. Well, that looks like we've proved an even stronger theorem. We have x over log squared x pairs of practical numbers in this interval with this GCD criterion. And for each pair, we, we choose A1 and A2, and we get twin practicals up to x. So why doesn't this give x over log squared x? Well, the trouble is, is that we could be overcounting, that the same twin pair could arise in multiple ways from this expression. Well, we um, handle this by first not choosing any practical numbers in this interval. We only choose those which don't have too many prime factors. And we can use sort of analogs of the hardy ramanujan theorem to show that if we can keep the total number of prime factors of M1 and M2, that's big omega counts the total number of prime factors with multiplicity 
we can keep them under control. And the, this function that takes M1 and M2 to, to A1 is um, going to be more or less one to one. In fact, it's at most two to one using the inequality that we have and uh, the fact that we have the practical numbers in this interval. So um, it means th that we can again discard, we're not gonna hit numbers too often uh, with large values, large numbers of prime factors. So we can assume that the number of prime factors of A1 and A2 are under control. So with those two under control, it means the total number of divisors of A1, M1, and A2, M2 is the power of log. And that tracing it back gets that power of log we had in that previous theorem. So another connection between primes and practical numbers brings in the primes themselves. So uh, a couple of years ago, Guo and Weingartner uh, looked at uh, shifted primes that are practical. So P is a prime number. P minus one is the shifted prime, one less than the prime P. And we wonder if this even number is practical. And they proved the count for that, again, with the lower bound and upper bound. You might recognize this exponent, which we saw earlier. So in the same paper that I have with Weingartner recently, uh, we showed that this exponent here on log x is not 0.086, but in fact, one. So that's the upper bound. Presumably, again, this is the truth. And the lower bound, we improved the exponent there. For our upper bound proof, we write a practical number as uh, m times q, where now q is the largest prime factor of n. And if n is one less than a prime, if n plus one is pr prime, um, for a given number m, here we have m, we ask for primes q going uh, up to uh, say x over m with mq plus one also prime. So here we have a sieve with two primality conditions and this essentially gives us a, a, a log squared x. And you can see that this expression is just x over log squared x. So again, there are some technicalities because uh, uh, Q might be small uh, and then the sieving interval is not so long, but we handle those, um, the cases where M is smooth and therefore Q is small, uh, or when this, this is a factor that comes up in the sieve, we have to wonder when that's large. So we have to handle those technicalities to prove our upper bound. So for the lower bound, um, here's how we did that. So um, so we, we take a, a number n that's practical. We, take, we look at primes up to n squared, where p is one mod n. Uh, suppose there are plenty of such primes. And if we write P minus one is A times N, that'll be practical automatically because A is going to be smaller than N. N is practical. So this number is automatically practical. However, we don't know that if we take primes up to N squared, we don't know even if any of them will be one mod N. However, if we're just a little bit below if our modulus is just a little bit below square root of x, like square root of x divided by a uh, high power of log x, then we can use the bombieri vinogradov theorem to show that there are many pairs p and n, where p is one mod n. But the trouble now is that a is not gonna be smaller than n, and a could be a bit bigger than n. Well, that's still okay, so long as a doesn't have any big prime factors. So we use an upper bound on the sieve 
to rule out the case when A has big prime factors and we are whole. Now, we could have used, instead of the bombieri vinogradov theorem, a new theorem of James Maynard, um, which is an improvement of the bombieri vinogradov theorem in, um, in the case when you have a fixed residue class, which is the case that we'd be looking at. We're looking at the residue class one. Actually, it was, it was sort of hard to find this photo of Vinogradov on the web. There's another uh, uh, Soviet number theorist named Vinogradov. I am Vinogradov. That's, that's, has, he's more famous, has more photos on the web. But apparently this is our AI Vinogradov. The, the notation less than, less than that we've been using is often called the Vinogradov notation. I'm not sure to whom it's due. It might be to him or to I am. For, for prime numbers, we have the Goldbach conjecture. Even numbers should be a sum of, of two primes. So Morgenstern conjectured, well, he tried to conjecture that for practicals. Well, practicals are even. So if you take two practicals, the sum will be even. So he conjectured that every even number is the sum of two practicals. And he wanted to say, well, what about odds? Don't leave them out. And he said that every odd number should be uh, the sum of a prime and a practical. So Giuseppe Melfi proved the Morgenstern conjecture for the even numbers. He proved that the, uh, every um, even number is the sum of two practical numbers. And now in our paper with uh, Weingartner, we, we essentially did the odd part. We did it for sufficiently large odd numbers. So we're trying to prove that a large odd number is the sum of a prime and a practical. So let's let A be an odd number in the interval between X and two X. And uh, let's let N run over the practical numbers that are a bit smaller than square root of x and use the bombieri vinogradov theorem to find primes p up to x in the residue class a mod n. Okay, so you notice here that a is bigger than x and p is less than or equal to x. So we have these, these double inequalities. And so therefore a minus p is greater than zero. And a minus p is going to be divisible by n. So it means that a minus p is some multiple of n. This multiple b is not much bigger than n. And again, we can use sieve methods to rule out the case where b has a large prime factor. So this proves that a is the sum of p and bn. And when b doesn't have a large prime factor, bn is practical. And that proves the conjecture for sufficiently large um, odd numbers. So you might wonder if you could use these ideas to prove the full conjecture, that there aren't any exceptions. Well, that would be tricky to do with the bombier vinogradov theorem. I'm not sure if it would be tricky with Maynard's theorem, I'm guessing so. But the bombier vinogradov theorem depends upon Ziegel's Theorem. Ziegel's theorem is the quintessential non-effective, ineffective theorem in analytic number theory. You cannot make the constants um, explicit unless you ex assume the extended Riemann hypothesis. And if you assume the extended Riemann hypothesis, we actually have a very strong prime number theorem for residue classes. We have this wonderful inequality for the number of primes uh, up to x in the residue class a mod n. That's what you'd expect, one over the Euler phi function of n times logarithmic integral of x. And it's, that difference is smaller than square root of x times log of n squared x. Starting right from the beginning. So if you assume this prime number theorem, um, we can prove that the Morgenstern conjecture 
holds perhaps at some starting point like e to the 10,000. So now for the computationalists in the audience, your job is cut out for you. Just check all odd numbers up to e to the 10,000 and see that they're all um, the sum of a prime and a uh, practical. Well, Tomas Oliveira e Silva got it started for you. He showed up to 10 to the nine, it, it holds. But actually we were able to get further than that. And let me describe this, this neat method of, of going further. Um, take a, a power of two. And for each odd residue class A mod that power of two, compute the least prime in that residue class. So for example, suppose K is four. So we have two to the four is 16. And we have the odd residue classes up to 16. There are only three residue classes up to 16 that are not prime already. Those are one, nine, and 15. And if you look at the first prime that's one mod 16, that's 17. The first prime that's nine mod 16, that's uh, 41. And the first prime that's 15 mod 16, that's 31. So the largest of these least primes is 41. Well, that's um, going to immediately imp uh, imply our theorem in an interval, as we'll see in a minute. Um, Linux theorem says that the largest of these least primes is bounded, but it doesn't give us that it's small. Uh, it, numerically, in practice, it will be small, so, say smaller than this bound k squared times two to the k. So that might be tra tractable to search up to this point for k of moderate size. So once this largest of the least primes is found, we've proved the Morgenstern conjecture for every odd number in the interval above p and up to this next power of two, two to the two k plus one. Because if a is an odd number in this range, and look um, at the residue class a mod two to the k, and take a prime in that residue class that's less than or equal to p, and, um, and look at a plus q times two to the kb, b is small, and this is gonna be practical. So um, we have the odd number a as a prime plus a practical. So in our toy example, just doing that, mental calculation to get 41, we immediately have that every odd number up to 512 is representable as a prime and a practical. Um, we actually implemented this up to uh, two to the 53. If we, we could prove that every number up to two to the 53 is, uh, is sum of a prime and a practical. You don't have to even go to this height, k squared times two to the k. If you only go to three k, two to the k, then it should be conjecturally only a small fraction of unrepresented residue classes, one in 5,000 or less. And then in those, find those classes and then search over them individually. Finally, let's look at this problem. So Landau, has a famous conjecture that between consecutive squares is always a prime. Can you prove this for practical numbers? Well, this was done in 1984 by Miriam Hausman and Harold Shapiro. And a small improvement was found by Melfi. One can ask, in fact, if there's always a practical number in a short interval, x up to x plus x to the epsilon. And we don't have that. We don't have that for any epsilon smaller than one half. So that would follow from an argument based upon conjectures about smooth numbers. And so Granville has a famous survey about smooth numbers. And in it, he has a featured conjecture, which says that in the interval x up to x plus x to the beta, is going to be an x to the alpha smooth number. Here alpha and beta are any fixed positive numbers and x is sufficiently large in terms of alpha and beta. 
if we have that, then um, we, uh, and we're looking at x up to x plus x to the epsilon, we can take the first power of two above x to the epsilon over two and consider the multiples of that power of two that um, in this interval. And we want this b to be x to the epsilon over two smooth. So by this featured Granville conjecture, there will, there will be b's in this interval that are so smooth. And then that b times two to the k will be practical. But this may not be the only way to prove uh, the conjecture about short intervals. Anyway, going to these uh, number theory web seminars week after week, I see that people are doing really wonderful things. I'm not sure if what I'm talking about is so wonderful, but at least it's practical. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>